All right. Well, uh, welcome to another session of the Bakey CV Live. Randall Wolf here, uh, coming to you from Dr. Miranda's library. You'll see the background. I'm in Dr. Miranda's library, uh, who is a world famous anatomist who's helped me understand some of the areas of AFib that we've been working on for several years. Um, what I'd like to present to you today is excerpts of a lecture that I gave at the Dallas meeting uh, last month. And I think it's appropriate because I've sort of had an epiphany that's only taken me 20 years to get to, and that is to try to understand uh, AFib and really look at this old problem with maybe a new perspective. So it's a new look at an old problem. The old problem is AFib, uh, but I think based on the 20 years of experience, I've come to understand what really maybe is happening in AFib to some degree. Nobody knows for sure. So some of the things I'll be talking about are my impressions, my experience uh, over 20 years uh, dealing with AFib in patients, and uh, the lessons that I've learned um, taking care of patients who suffer from AFib. What do patients really want? They want hope, number one. And hope is probably halfway to happiness. So the most discouraging thing that you can occur when you have a chronic disease such as AFib is you're going to have this the rest of your life. You can't get rid of it. You're going to be on blood thinners the rest of your life. And we can try to give you medications to control it, but it'll probably never be cured. Well, that doesn't give us much hope, does it? Uh, so what I've tried to do is find a way to really cure AFib. Um, cure is a word that has different meanings. If someone has cancer and they're treated and they're then cancer-free for five years, they're called cured. Well, we have patients 20 years out with the treatment that I'll mention to you today that have no recurrence. People say that's not a cure. It can come back. That's true. But cancer can come back too. But if you go five years free of cancer, it's considered a cure. Why not with AFib? Something to think about. So there is a patient, uh, Ross Robluski, who uh, had AFib. He underwent the mini maze several years ago. He was a uh, he owned a uh, skydiving uh, company. Uh, he was pretty much grounded because of AFib. He loved to skydive. He also uh, had uh, planes he took people up in. And he underwent the mini maze procedure. He also had a benign tumor on his spine, which uh, I removed at the same time. And sometime after his procedure, I can't remember if it was six months or a year, uh, he sent me a short video. And I think the video is self-explanatory. So this is a gentleman. Uh, he looks younger than his stated age, which I think is maybe 60s, but he looks younger than that. And had continuous AFib, had the mini maze procedure. Uh, and here he is about six months to a year later. And we'll go to uh, the slide presentation here. And hopefully you'll see that picture in picture. And let's see if we can bring him up here. And I'm hitting the button. I'm not getting anything yet. Let me try this button. Nope. Refrain, I'm hitting this button. I'm not getting any movement here. Okay. That's so very easy. Let's do it again. There. There we go. And he also did a little infomercial for me. Why he was up there skydiving. 
pretty amazing. So he's back in sinus rhythm. He's on no medications. And I love this parting scene. This this is uh, pretty amazing. See you, Ross. So you can imagine uh, for a skydiver, being on a blood thinner is not a good idea. So he's no longer on blood thinners. He's no longer on any medications. And he's able to pursue what makes him happy, which is skydiving. Now, this is sort of a lecture, a didactic. Uh, but I think to start out, I want to make the point that I'm going to make at the end of the of the of the presentation. And that is, best I can tell, AFib is a nerve problem. And it's based on a problem with the autonomic nerves. These autonomic nerves are on the outside of the heart. The medical term is epicardial. These are epicardial nerves. So I think one of the challenges for a treatment such as catheter ablation is we're starting on the inside of the heart, but we're trying to affect nerves that are on the outside of the heart. I'm a cardiac surgeon. I've seen the inside of many, many hearts, and there are no nerves on the inside of the heart. So burn or freeze from the inside of the heart has to go all the way to the outside to affect the epicardial nerves. And technically, that's not easy. It's a difficult thing to do. A couple of uh, uh, housekeeping things. Uh, I'm, we're coming to you from Houston Methodist Hospital and DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. Uh, this um, webcast is an idea of uh, our leader, head of DeBakey, which is Dr. Alan Lumsden, who came up with this idea of, of bringing the patients closer to the physicians and the ideas that we have, and therefore the webcast. Uh, the summer is usually off for our producing team. Uh, they're back on schedule now, so we hope to have these webcasts once a month, first Tuesday of the month, 5 p.m. Central Time, 5 p.m. Central Time, which would be 6 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time, of course. Uh, so this is the first one resuming our series now that the summer session is over and the producers are back in the studio. Um, so this is a picture of Dr. DeBakey, who started DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. This is our current DeBakey Tower. It was opened about six years ago. Uh, this is just the DeBakey Tower called the Walter Tower. Uh, it's uh, 21 stories high. And uh, Mr. Walter donated over 100 million of his own money to get it started. And then this is the lobby at the Walter Tower. And this lobby is dedicated to uh, the late president and Barbara Bush. Um, a disclosure of my own. Uh, I am the inventor of some of the Atricure products, some of the products you'll see from Atricure. Uh, these are the number one products sold to surgeons who do AFib surgery around the world. And I continue on the engineering product development team. We meet every few months, and there are close to 100 engineers at Atricure. Uh, we go over the prototypes, and we are still trying to make this even more minimally invasive. We're working on ideas that hopefully will come to fruition maybe five to 10 years uh, from now. So it's still very exciting. Uh, back in uh, 2005, I was quoted in Newsweek. This was a time when all the rage was minimally invasive bypass surgery. I was very involved in that, and they were interviewing me about minimally invasive bypass surgery. And I recognized the importance of uh, minimally invasive coronary bypass and uh, off-pump coronary bypass. But at the time, I started working on this AFib stuff. And I said there's been a lot of emphasis on bypass surgery because when you do your business plan, that's where the numbers are. But there are many exciting technologies that do not deal with bypass surgery that have great potential. And of course, one of those is what we're talking about now, and that's the treatment of atrial fibrillation, and more specifically, the minimally invasive treatment of AFib from a surgical standpoint. 
uh, 23 years ago in Cincinnati, and then, then in o, at Ohio State, when I was at Ohio State University and had a lab there, we started working on this idea of developing a clamp. This was with Mike Hooven, an engineer, that would create a line around the heart in less than 10 seconds and would create a line all the way through the muscle, but it wouldn't damage muscle. It's like drawing a pencil line. And we were keen on making what we call a transmural line, which went all the way through the muscle. But now that I look back on it, I think more importantly, we were on the epicardial surface. And we made a line on the epicardial surface, and that interrupted the nerves. And this is uh, an animal lab. I won't go into details about it. Some of you may be a little squeamish, but that's the first device that we worked on. And it made beautiful lines on the inside and the outside of the heart. So even though the clamp was placed on the outside of the heart, it made these beautiful lines, which you see here in white, on the inside of the heart. Then if a special stain is done, and we look at the heart muscle under a microscope, and we stain it a certain way called a crichrome stain, you can see that blue line across the middle in the upper right-hand side. Well, that's a tiny scar that's made by that clamp, and that interrupts the electrical signal. And that's the key. Remember, I said this is a nerve problem, not a muscle problem. <clears throat> so to me, it doesn't really make sense to burn up all the heart muscle on the inside if really what you want to do is interrupt the nerves on the outside. Back in uh, 2003, in Cincinnati, the first what's now known as a mini maze uh, was performed. We didn't call it that. It was called a bilateral VATS procedure, means video-assisted thoracic surgery. None of the incisions were big enough for the surgeon to put his or her hand into the chest. It was done on the beating heart. There was no heparinization, no heart-lung machine. And I like this picture because in the background is my mentor, uh, John Plaguey, at the University of Cincinnati, who's who's uh, passed on at this time, but he was a great mentor for me. And you can see he's standing my, behind my back. This is a very appropriate picture in a way because he was always, I think, watching my back. Initially, uh, we called this bilateral pulmonary vein isolation and exclusion of left atrial appendage. It wasn't called a mini maze. wasn't called a wolf mini maze. And it consisted of four parts, and it still does today. Isolating the pulmonary veins, a cardiac denervation, and that's in yellow because I think it's of ultimate importance. We confirmed that we got a pulmonary vein block, and then lastly, in the initial thousand patients, we we excised or cut off the left atrial appendage with a stapler that was already uh, on the market uh, that was used for lung procedures. And you can see in the little inset there uh, with the one of the early clamps, and you can see it's on the heart. You can see the veins uh, very clearly. Uh, you can see the superior vein, inferior vein. So we can see everything. We can do everything. It doesn't destroy the heart muscle. It simply makes a line, and that's what does the deal. Uh, from the patient standpoint, here's a patient. Uh, a cartoon of a patient with the left arm elevated. Uh, these uh, holes, if you will, are between the ribs. Again, on the beating heart while the patient is asleep, there are three holes. And through these three holes, we can really do everything we need to do, include closing the left atrial appendage. A few more pictures of, of what it looks like. Um, these are the, some of the instruments that we developed, and we still use these today. And this is another instrument that acts like a finger to get around the back of the heart. Because remember, the incisions aren't big enough to put our hands inside the body. And when we're finished, the largest incision is about five centimeters. If you put your three fingers together uh, from here to here is about five centimeters. That's the largest incision. Then there are two incisions that are about as big around as the end of your pinky. And these. Uh, incisions are both on the right side and the left side. Uh, this is uh, gives you a little glimpse. This is a 
one uh, centimeter port, and this is on the right side, and we put the scope in first. Again, as I said before, we can see everything, we can do everything. There's no radiation. We can see the heart sac very clearly. We can open the heart sac. All mammals have a heart sac, uh, whether you're a squirrel or a rabbit or a human, you have a sac around your heart. And in order to get to the heart surface, we open that sac. And although people, several people have asked me, although it's not on the videos that are online, I do close the heart sac uh, at the end of the procedure. You won't see it on the on the video, but in fact, we do uh, close it. So the heart sac is is closed at the end of the procedure on each side. And here you can see it's fairly simple. Uh, this is electrocautery, and we can open the heart sac. This is done very carefully, but we can see things quite clearly. And this is this is a 2D uh, video that you're seeing. Uh, it's actually even better uh, when we're in the operating room looking at a large monitor. But even on this uh, video, and it's very clear and very easy to see things. Now, when we get to uh, the part where we have the clamp in place, this is on the right side. Let's see, I think we just saw that one. Let's go ahead there. We can put the clamp and make the line. It takes about 10 seconds. We can also test for these nerves on the outside of the heart. And this is just a pen. It has two small electrodes that deliver a tiny amount of electricity, not enough that you can even feel it on your fingertip. But if we put it in a place where one of these nerves is, these autonomic nerves, these aren't the nerves that, that make your muscles uh, twitch. These are the autonomic nerves. These are the nerves that make your hands sweat when you look over the edge of a tall building or the nerves that make your heart go fast uh, when you're watching a scary movie. Why should your heart speed up? You're sitting in a chair probably watching a movie. These are the autonomic nerves that come from your brain and give stimulus to your heart. Your heart's probably happy to beat at 60 beats a minute your whole life, but it gets signals from your brain from the autonomic nervous system. And these signals suggest that your heart should speed up or slow down. Now, a long time ago, these signals were very important, particularly if you're trying to say outrun a, a tiger or a lion and your brain said, you better do something right away. We see an animal coming at you and the autonomic nerves send the signal to the heart, the heart races, you take off, it gives you more energy, more cardiac output. But unfortunately, over the years, we've become more sedentary, but we still get these signals from our brain. And part of that signal getting messed up is, I think, what causes the AFib. And again, these nerves are on the outside of the heart, not the inside. So this doesn't want to play here, so that's all right. Uh, the last part of the procedure is to close the left atrial appendage. Very important for four reasons. One, this decreases the chance of stroke. Many people uh, are misled. Uh, they're on a blood thinner, oftentimes not Coumadin anymore, but Eliquis or Pradaxa uh, or Xeralto, and they believe that this will protect them from stroke, which is true, but it decreases the stroke rate by 60%. If the appendage is closed, which is what we do with the mini maze, you don't have to take blood thinners anymore and your risk of a stroke is decreased by 97%. So you got 60% risk reduction versus 97% by closing the appendage. And by with closing the appendage, you do not have to take blood thinners anymore, even if you're out of rhythm. So this dramatically decreases the chance of stroke. It allows you to stop the blood thinners, even if you're not in rhythm. It also decreases the AFib focus because... In some patients, the appendage is quite large, and that can be a focus of AFib and part of the circuit where the AFib goes around the heart. So closing the appendage decreases the focus. Now, interestingly, some of you probably heard of the Watchman device, which is put in from the inside of the heart, and it can close the appendage, but it does not decrease the AFib focus. And I know that firsthand because I've operated on patients with a mini maze who've had a watchman device and I've tested the tip of the appendage 
and it still has electricity in it. So the appendage is not electrically isolated with the Watchman device. Closing the appendage or using the atriclyph, it is. And lastly, there have been some articles that have shown that also if the appendage is closed and you have high blood pressure, you have much better blood pressure control once the appendage is closed. Uh, there will be some questions coming in. I see some are coming in already. Uh, as some of you know, uh, pollev.com is one way to get to us. That's uh, on your computer, pollev.com. And then type in DeBakey, and you can put in your question. Another way, if you'd like to just uh, use your phone, uh, you simply go to 37607 texting 37607 and then type in the bakey and you can ask a question that way and uh we'll stack up our questions we'll take a few breaks and answer some of these questions so pollev.com or text 37607 and put in uh the bakey there you see it on your screen pollev.com and put in the bakey if you're on your computer if you're on your phone, go to text, put in 37607, and then type in uh, DeBakey. So closing left atrial appendage, in my opinion, is far superior than a closure with a Watchman device. And if the Watchman device is in, then we can't go back and put a clip in or staple it. You Pretty much what you see is what you get. I have been able to go back during the mini maze and uh, make a line, a block around the base of the appendage with that pen that you saw in that one video. Uh, so we have been able to decrease the electrical activity of the appendage after the watchman's been placed by uh, using the pen. Uh, that's anecdotal. That's what I have done. Uh, I have not published on that. We don't have any long-term outcomes on that treatment uh, as of today. What's the appendage look like if you remove it? Uh, it looks like this. Uh, the first thousand cases, I removed it. Uh, in Tokyo, uh, uh, Dr. Otsuka, who does the Wolf Otsuka or WO procedure, uh, still removes it with a stapler. Um, it's uh, less expensive in Japan to use the stapler. Uh, but in the United States, I generally use the Atra clip now because it's a little bit quicker, it's a little bit easier, perhaps it's a little bit safer, uh, and it's readily available to us in the United States. The uh, video is here, but I, my guess is it's not going to play, but that's the left, left atrial appendage. Oh, it is going to play. Okay. So this is the atriclip device. We've opened the heart sac on the left side. That first video, we were on the right side. Now we're on the left side, and we gently allow the appendage to enter the clip. And once we have the appendage completely in the clip, to the left of the screen is the heart. Everything to the right of the of the applier is the appendage. That all that metal is the applier. And once we release the applier, there's the appendage with the clip in place. So in this case we leave the appendage in place and it's clipped at the base. But now as opposed to the watchman, it's electrically silent. And I think that's uh, very important. Uh, we usually monitor our patients for five years with a link device. This is a device that's placed under the skin. It allows us to see the EKG every day for five years. So we follow our patients very objectively. Uh, we just... Uh, completed an IRB at Methodist Hospital. We have permission to proceed with a retrospective study of um, one to 200 patients who've had the link in for two to three years. So very objective results of patients who've had the mini maze procedure. And by the way, uh, uh, what we've seen so far is the mini maze works in all types of AFib, paroxysmal, persistent, long-standing persistent. If you go to the um, uh, wolfminimaze.com uh, page. Uh, uh, Dr. Miranda uh, has has outlined what the difference is between paroxysmal, persistent, and long-standing persistent. 
Uh, so you can look at that. But the mini maze works for all three. And I think it's because we're interrupting the nerves on the outside of the heart. Uh, that's the key. Initially, when I started doing this procedure, almost all the patients had had multiple failed ablations. Today, about half the patients have multiple failed ablations, and about half the patients I see have decided to go with the mini maze one and done as their first procedure instead of their third, fourth, or fifth uh, procedure. We first published uh, our initial results a long time ago. It was back in 2005, and it was called Video Assisted Bilateral Pulmonary Vein Isolation and Left Atrial Appendage Exclusion for Atrial Fibrillation. Uh, one of my patients came to me at Christmas and said, Doc, you got to come up with a different name. That's never going to fly. And he's the patient that started the original website that was called Wolf Mini Maze. So that was back in about 2006. It has evolved greatly over the years. We've had a major revamp here in the last few months, uh, guided by Dr. Miranda and his team. And it really has much better information on it. It's much easier to go through. So if you go to wolfminimaze.com, I, I think you'll like this uh, new look a lot better. A lot of information on there. And there are also ways to go from that information, take a deeper dive uh, with certain uh, things that are highlighted, highlighted in the Wolf Mini Maze uh, website. Uh, what did we find? Uh, well, this was uh, uh, a presentation and a manuscript uh, from all oh, about six years ago, seven years ago. Oh, more than that. Look at that. 2014. Time flies. So it's already about nine years ago. And these were patients out to six years. And with the different types of AFib, we had very good results. AFib free rate in the 90%, 85%, 75% for the different types of AFib. And uh, this is back when you, if right now at Methodist, if someone has persistent AFib and they have two catheter ablations, uh, the chances of being in rhythm one year later are about 36% versus we're running 85% uh, out to six years. Now we have patients out 20 years with long-standing persistent AFib who are still AFib-free and medication-free. Now, some people have said, well, the mini maze won't work for long-standing persistent, but it does. Now, here's the article. This was the totally thoroscopic maze procedure for the treatment of atrial fibrillation, 2017. Uh, this uh, was a paper where they took 14 different studies of mini maze. It's also called TT maze by some people. TT maze is a mini maze with four incisions like this instead of two incisions like this and one like this, but it's essentially the same procedure, although I don't think they were checking the nerves uh, like I do routinely. Uh, but 14 studies, uh, over 1,100 patients, and what they found was Results were just as good as a Cox Maze 4, which at the time was an open procedure. And the one-year uh, uh, pooled off antiarrhythmic success rate was 81%. That's for all comers. And the uh, this was uh, similar to a two-year follow-up with the regular Cox Maze 4 uh, procedure. So the outcomes are very good. Well, with catheter ablation, the results, it's not an easy procedure. And with persistent AFib, with a one-year AFib free rate of 38%, uh, EP said, well, let's look at it differently. Let's look at the quality of life, uh, which is a more subjective way to look at uh, results. Well, we've done that with mini maze too. And this was a study, retrospective study of, of my own patients. And initially from one to 10, what would you rate your quality of life before the mini maze? And you can see there it's one is not very good. 10 is I really feel great. And as you would imagine, most people who have suffered from AFib don't feel so great. And it's not just from being an AFib. It's from the drugs too. It's the medications. People would come back to me and say, doc, I feel 10 years younger after the mini maze. And I go, wow, 10 years younger. Okay. You're in rhythm. But I slowly realized over time, this is another lesson I learned, it's not just the AFib that makes you feel so lousy, it's also the drugs you have to take. And generally, 
the amount of drugs has increased over time to try to control the AFib. So part of it's getting in rhythm. The other part is getting off some of these drugs. In the lower graph, you can see how would you rate your quality of life after the mini maze, and you can see uh, most patients are eight, nine, and ten. Four, five, and six was so each had one patient. So quite a difference from the top graph before the mini maze to the bottom graph after the mini maze. Uh, I get letters uh, all the time um, from patients. Uh, these are really testimonials. Uh, which you'll see on the uh, uh, Mini Maze site, the Facebook site. Uh, it's uh, Live AFib Free uh, Wolf Mini Maze, and that's run by uh, Sandra Schreemeyer, who is also a, was a sufferer of AFib and did have the Mini Maze procedure, I think it's been over four years ago now. Uh, in fact, I know that's true because she had the original link uh, under the skin to monitor AFib, and that battery lasted three years, and we replaced that about a year ago or so uh, with a new battery that lasts uh, five years. And here's one such person, uh, and he said, Doc, you can use my name. It's fine. Uh, this is Godfrey Kleber, and he was thanking me for getting rid of his AFib. Um, his operation was in January 2004, so he was one of the early mini maze patients that I did at the University of Cincinnati. Um, so uh, he uh, said, I saw Stephen Lewis yesterday uh, and he's sent me an EKGs and perfect sinus rhythm. So he's getting close to 20 years, 20 years out now uh, with no, uh, at, at the time of this letter, at least uh, no uh, recurrent uh, AFib. Now I'd like to present a few cases to you, but before we do that, We'll take a little bit of a break and take care of some of these uh, questions. And uh, the first question is, what is the maximum left atrium size in milliliters per meter squared according to CT scan with contrast that you can do a Wolf Mini Maze or Cox Maze on? Good question. Someone's really been doing their, their homework because there are a couple of factors that determine a good result from any procedure on AFib. One of the most important ones is the size of the left atrium, which Jim Cox uh, documented years ago, and it's still true. And in general, uh, not correcting for meters squared, if the left atrium has more than 200 mLs in it, then after that, two over 200, the good results start to decrease. However, if the patient says, I know I was in rhythm a year ago or two years ago, they still do well. But the combination of being out of rhythm for maybe more than five years, my rule of five, and having a left atrium greater than 5.5 centimeters, which gets close to 200 milliliters, decreases the chance that you'll stay in rhythm. You'll still be able to get off blood thinners, though, because the appendage is closed. But we've seen good results even in patients uh, who've had more than 200 mLs. A good example is uh, a Medtronic rep uh, who uh, had chronic AFib. He'd been out of rhythm for years. His left atrium was greater than 200 milliliters, and he's passed a year now. He's off all medications after the mini maze, perfect sinus rhythm. His family says he's like a new man. Uh, so, But generally, once it gets over 200 milliliters, uh, we then think, well, the results may not be as spectacular as we would like. Um, uh, Dr. Wolf, I'm so pleased with my results in having the Wolf Mini Maze back the end of June of this year. I have an older family member in AFib since at least from January 2021. Can the Wolf Mini Maze help them? Absolutely. Absolutely. They've already had a stroke, and that is when they found out they had AFib. They're now in persistent AFib. Absolutely. The mini maze works very well in that situation. Uh, let's see. And that will do one more here. I'm 15 weeks post ablation for AFib. Two weeks after the ablation, I assume this is a catheter ablation. I developed atrial flutter. Well, this is the most one of the most common complications of catheter ablation. Now we're talking about catheter ablation, 
not the mini maze. Um, very commonly, the patients developed left atrial flutter. I developed atrial flutter. I continue to have episodes that alternate between AFib and flutter every few days. When I'm in flutter, my pulse goes to 150. I feel discomfort in my chest, but in AFib, pulse is around 100. The EP wants to do another ablation on the right atrium for the flutter, touch up the pulmonary veins, and do a vein of Marshall. That's putting alcohol in the vein of Marshall. Well, the vein of Marshall has some nerves in it. Uh, he said he only did a light, light touches when doing the ablation the first time. My question is, could the flutter be coming from the left atrium since he only did a light ablation? My understanding from your procedure would address this, or should I go ahead as EP recommends? Well, it's almost always some left flutter too. And it's because the pulmonary veins are incompletely isolated and the nerves are not treated. And I'll get to that in a few examples, but, uh, this is a very, very common situation. What I find is when I go in and check the nerves with that pen, the, the, I'm not, what we find is on the inside, there may be isolation and the EPs check on the inside and they find the veins are isolated. But guess what? On the outside, they're not. So the key is to isolate it on the outside where the nerves are. And that almost always takes care of the left atrial flutter. I did not think it would initially, but I had some patients who uh, talked me into doing the uh, procedure after they had persistent uh, left atrial flutter, which is, in some people, a real problem. Some patients say, I wish I had my old AFib back. They don't tolerate the flutter very well. Uh, but the mini maze works in that situation, and it works quite well because they have incomplete treatment of the nerves on the outside of the heart. And that's what the mini maze takes care of. Um, does a washman protect you as much as clamping the LAA to prevent ischemic hemorrhagic stroke? I say no. Now, I'm opinionated, of course. Uh, I've been involved with these closure devices. Uh, but I don't think it does. First of all, a lot of the washmen, uh, they leak for a while. And in fact, the FDA has recommended if a person has a watchman device, you should stay on aspirin for the rest of your life. Right after the watchman device is placed, the stroke rate goes up. And then it starts to go down, but it goes up first. With the clip or closing the appendage, as Dr. Otsuka still does and I used to do, the stroke rate goes down immediately. It doesn't go up and down. It just goes down. Now, hemorrhagic strokes are made worse if a patient's on aspirin. But yet, if you have the watchman, it's recommended that you stay on aspirin for the rest of your life. I was at a big meeting a couple of years ago, a hematologist presented, and they showed two big studies that showed staying on aspirin didn't help at all with AFib. In fact, it hurt because if you had a stroke, it was more likely to be a bleeding stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, I'll take another question here. I have new onset for persistent AFib. That means they're probably in it all the time, or it's lasted more than seven days, or they've had a cardioversion to try to get back in rhythm. I was pretty active, but now I feel washed out and tired all the time. I walk and my heart rate jumps to 140. What can I do to help my stamina? Stamina. Oh, well, um, you might want to consider a mini maze or a catheter ablation or drugs. Those are really the three choices you have generally. Take medications, which may work for a while. Uh, generally, they tend to fail over time. They have side effects, which we've talked about briefly. Catheter ablation, which people feel is less invasive or mini maze, or an open maze, or a Cox maze 4 done minimally invasively, but on the heart-lung machine. Well, when someone says the catheter ablation is less invasive, my reply is yes, it's less invasive on your skin because you only have puncture wounds in your groin, but it's more invasive on your heart because you're burning the inside of the left atrium. And once that tissue is burned or frozen, it doesn't come back. So I would say, yes, catheter ablation is less invasive on your skin, but more invasive on your heart. And what's more important? Your skin's going to heal. 
I'd rather be less invasive on the heart. Uh, am I a candidate for the Wolf Mini Maze if my only symptom is accelerated heart rate of 200 during exercise? It goes back to normal shortly after I stop. Message was cut off. Well, it depends. And I think this is a situation where it's worthwhile to have a, a talk, a conversation. Uh, we do virtual visits every week. Uh, so you can have a virtual visit uh, by telephone or with Zoom, and we can discuss specifically specifically what your symptoms are. Are you already on medications? That means of you're having breakthrough with the medication. Get more information about your particular situation to make a decision. Another thing is sometimes I implant the link before deciding to do a procedure to see what the AFib burden is. Is your heart out of rhythm 1%, less than 1%, 5%, 20%? It makes a difference in how aggressive we might be with trying to treat the AFib. So don't forget that. Sometimes the link is very helpful to be put in before the procedure. Uh, now I'd like to go back to a little bit more of the slides, and, and then we'll answer some more questions. Again, pollev.com on your computer, put in DeBakey. Or if you're on your phone, put in 37607 and then type in the box DeBakey and you can ask a question. Uh, these um, virtual visits don't, don't obligate you to any procedure, uh, but it can give you a second opinion for some of you. If you decide it's maybe this isn't the way for you to go, that's fine. But it can give you a second opinion. Uh, you can call, you can go to wolfminimaze.com. And there is a place there to fill in your information, and we can get you set up for a virtual visit. Uh, you can also call 713-441-9342, uh, but that's on the Wolf Mini Maze uh, site as well, uh, if you'd like to talk to uh, Kimberly uh, directly. Uh, now we're going to go back to the uh, slideshow here and go through a couple case examples that I think really explain some important things. Uh, this, uh, we'll go back to the slideshow. This is uh, a lady from uh, Long Island. She had six failed ablations. Uh, she had multiple failed cardioversions. The EP downloaded this picture to her phone and said, look, there's nothing else we can do. Red is dead on your left atrium. Uh, don't go to Houston. They can't help you. Uh, couldn't She couldn't get back in rhythm despite multiple cardioversions and drugs. She came to Houston anyway. She had the mini maze. Her heart changed to sinus rhythm before we were done with the mini maze. No cardioversions, no shocks. The veins weren't completely isolated on the outside. On this map, they're isolated on the inside. That doesn't mean they're isolated on the outside. The outside is where the nerves are. It makes a difference. Here's the previous uh, failed catheter ablation again. Uh, on this, this is this lady. Only one of the veins was really isolated. The ganglionic plexi, the nerve, the autonomic nerves on the outside of the heart were very active. And as I said, she went into rhythm uh, spontaneously. And that's about a year ago. Another patient, previous catheter ablation three times. You can see on the veins a couple of little white spots where the catheter ablation did make it all the way through to the outside of the heart. But it just looks like a couple of spots. And that is not going to cut it. That will not isolate the ganglionic plexi. We do testing all the time, and this is where I still differ from everybody else that I know that does a procedure like this. I test with that pen. The top line is the EKG that you would see in your doctor's office. The second line is the EKG on the heart, on the vein. After three ablations, they said the veins were isolated, but you can clearly see the black lines that get big there. Those are signals. So the veins are not isolated on the outside. The top vein, the bottom vein, or in between. That's the second line where it says ECG1. They're not isolated. So we do the mini maze, put the clamp on, and these ganglionic plexi are in that fat there. We isolate that. There you can see that area isolated with the clamp. Now we test again. The second line where it says ECG1, now it really is isolated, nothing. 
it's a flat line. So now for the first time, the patient does have isolated veins on the top, on the bottom, and in between. And what you have to remember is this electric control, the electrical control of the heart is a dual system. There's the intrinsic system, which is your own pacemaker that sends signals through your heart. And like I said, that system would be perfectly happy to beat 60 times a minute your whole life. That's the intrinsic system. But the autonomic nerves on the outside, they're epicardial, and that's the other system. So AFib is a nerve problem, and I know not everybody's going to agree with this argument, and that's okay, but I think they still should consider it. It does provide a model which explains the results in the treatment of AFib, and I don't think this model should be ignored. So here's a picture of the brain and the spinal cord and the autonomic nerves that go to the heart. They go all over to the heart, the left ventricle, the left atrium, the right atrium. We're specifically targeting these nerves that are on the left atrium because that's where most of the initiation of AFib happens. And these nerves are these yellow spidery things on the outside of the heart, not the inside of the heart. So we do what's called GP ablation, ganglionic plexi ablation. These are the autonomic nerves. We wrote about this. This is an article that we published, oh gosh, back in 2007, so a long time ago. We even show where these areas are on the outside of the heart where these nerves seem to be quite predominant. This is an article not published by me, but published by other people ganglionic plexi for the treatment of AFib. It's got 167 references in this article. There's a lot that's been done about AFib and the autonomic nerves and the ganglionic plexi. If you'd like to read more about this, I direct you to the website. I direct you to Dr. Miranda's website, which is what? Clinicalanatomy.com. Clinicalanatomy.com. And you can read about where these are and the importance of the ganglionic plexi and AFib. Um, this is a, a schematic that uh, Dr. Miranda was kind enough to, to make for us. And it shows these little dotty areas, these little polka dot areas. And let's color those in yellow. And those are the fat pads. And those were... That's where the ganglionic plexi live. So these fat pads on the outside of the heart have these tiny nerves. You cannot see the nerves, but we can test them. So what happens in a mini maze procedure? Well, that number one in green, that's one of the, the clamp lines. And you can see it directly interrupts the yellow polka dot area which were, are the fat pads are in the ganglionic plexi. The second line gets even more of the ganglionic plexi on the right. The third line gets the fat pads around the superior vena cava, which is the main vein coming into the heart. This is all part of the mini maze. These are the green lines. The fourth line is on the left side. It gets around the ganglionic plexi and isolates them. And then the last line, is for the uh, left atrial appendage. So you can see from an anatomic point of view, which I think is very important, that we have addressed where these nerves are in the fat pads. And that is key, key, key in my mind. There have even been some studies that show if you zap the spine right after open heart surgery for coronary bypass, you decrease the AFib that happens after bypass. We did a study on that. We took patients who had heart transplant at uh, uh, Texas Medical Center, St. Luke's Hospital, um, and this was uh, with the uh, with uh, well, was, uh, with a good friend of mine, Dr. Cohn, and his group at Texas Heart, which is across the street from Methodist. And we took uh, hundreds of patients who had a heart transplant. And we looked at the instance of AFib. Now, if you just have bypass surgery or you have um, um, 
aortic valve surgery, uh, your risk of AFib post-op is high, 35 to 50%. Well, how about a heart transplant? You know what the risk of AFib was after a heart transplant? 2%. Why is it so low? Well, I would present to you that the reason is, is because you've done the best denervation of the heart. You've cut all the nerves and put a new heart in. And in fact, they have a very low incidence of AFib. Now, there's some other interesting work that suggests these fat pads where the nerves are, are active. And maybe these fat pads get angry and that irritates the nerves and that could cause the AFib as well. So there's some people looking into that. It's a very interesting area of study. People looking at inflammatory cytokines in this epicardial fat that could affect these epicardial nerves. So uh, if we look at catheter ablation versus mini maze versus a conversion procedure, which by the way is not a mini maze, it burns the back of the heart, but does not get all the nerves. And a conversion procedure still relies on the catheter ablation to do part of the work. The left atrial appendage is only isolated with the mini maze. You stop blood thinners only if you've had the mini maze, not the catheter ablation or the conversion procedure. And the nerves are only isolated with the mini maze procedure. So the lessons I've learned is you want to stop AFib, you really need an epicardial treatment. And in long-standing persistent AFib, burning the eight muscle from the inside, in other words, catheter ablation has a very low success rate. So if you target the neural origins, the nerves, it's more efficient, eliminates blood thinners. And that's pretty much uh, what I've learned in doing this uh, AFib uh, surgery. And here's a picture, lastly, of uh, the farm where I grew up. I learned to improvise on the farm. The only time we ever called anybody was a veterinarian. Uh, so we learned to do, and I think that's why it's been helpful to me in heart surgery. I've learned to improvise and try new ways. A um, couple more questions I'd like to get to, and then we'll wrap it up. Again, we'll be meeting uh, monthly now through the winter, uh, first Tuesday. Uh, this is the DeBakey CV Live, 5 p.m. Central Time. The next uh, session I'd like to do uh, will be with several patients who suffered from AFib. Uh, so we'll have uh, three or four patients. You'll be able to ask your questions. They'll tell their stories. I think it'll be very informative uh, for all of us. Uh, what do you do for sedation during surgery is a question. This is a, this is heart surgery. It's minimally invasive. The patients are awake at the end of the procedure, but it's still a general anesthetic and you're completely asleep. Could someone with slightly overactive thyroid, slight micro valve prolapse still be a candidate for wolf mini maze? Yes, but the thyroid has to be under control. You have to be euthyroid because elevated thyroid increases your chances of AFib. So you want to get you thyroid first, normal thyroid, and see if that cures your AFib. If it doesn't, then you could consider a mini maze. Dr. Wolf, aortic root enlarged four centimeters, the same as aortic aneurysm, can it be repaired? Aortic root of four centimeters is something we watch, we don't operate on. The normal aortic root's about two centimeters, twice that is four centimeters, Anything over four, we consider enlarged, but it depends on how big you are. Are you six, eight? Four may be pretty normal. Are you five, two? Well, then it's enlarged, but we generally don't operate until they get over five or 5.5 centimeters. It can be watched with a non-invasive study. Um, uh, can a wolf mini maze be done if you're in rhythm? Yeah, it doesn't matter to, at the time of the mini maze procedure, it doesn't Unlike catheter ablation, it does not matter if you're in rhythm or not. It makes no difference as far as performing the procedure. Uh, I have episodes of tachycardia. I'm on metropolo, which is a uh, metropolo, which is a beta blocker, flecainide. Never been taken off meds since my ablation 20 months ago. Well, if you want to get off medications, you should consider a mini maze. I don't really consider uh, the ablation successful if you're still on a beta blocker, and a antiarrhythmic. That's my opinion. Maybe you'd want to get a second opinion with us. Go to wolfminimaze.com. Uh, we can do a virtual visit. Does Eliquis or other novel 
anticoagulants increase the risk of hemorrhagic stroke, even though they reduce the risk of ischemic stroke. Uh, so an atriclip LAA is still the best. Uh, yeah, for the reasons that we discussed, not only is the clipping uh, dramatically decrease your chances of uh, stroke compared to a NOAC or oral a novel oral anticoagulant, uh, but also if you get off blood thinners, you got less of a chance of hemorrhagic stroke for sure. So we're coming up on the end of the hour. Uh, I've tried to give you uh, my own personal opinion on AFib and something that's uh, worked uh, in our practice now for, for 20 years. Uh, uh, you have multiple treatments for AFib. You as a patient have sure. to decide uh, what's best for you. Um, medicines are uh, an option. Catheter ablation is an option. Mini maze may be an option for you. A uh, Cox maze 4 on bypass may be an op option for you. I think the key is for you to do your homework, your own homework, like you're doing now, and for you to decide what's the best for you. But the key is have all your options well delineated to decide what's best for you. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this session of uh, the Bakey CV Live uh, AFib. I look forward to uh, visiting with you again. There, All the questions were excellent as usual. Uh, it'll again be the first Tuesday of uh, next month. Uh, 5 p.m. Central Time. I've asked already asked Sandy Schreemeyer to join us to be one of our panel members, and we've picked a few other uh, patients in the spectrum of AFib that can uh, give you some uh, upfront and personal experiences with AFib that maybe you can relate to. Uh, thank you very much. Have a, a great rest of this uh, first week after Labor Day. Goodbye, everybody.